Cool. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is David. This is Phil. We are production engineers at Facebook, and we'll be talking about what we do with CentOS on our fleet. So, quick agenda for today. We will start with a few words about our infrastructure and how things work. <coughs> we'll then deep dive into packaging and talk specifically about challenges running RPM and the NFS scale. We'll then discuss the issue of operating system upgrades. And finally, we'll close with some words about what happens after CentOS 7. So we're going to talk a little bit about our infrastructure. Um, as you might imagine, Facebook has a lot of machines. Uh, this is a picture of actual machines at Facebook. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of machines and data centers all over the world. Um, and when I say this, I mean actual physical machines, which comes with all of the fun uh, problems that come with managing physical infrastructure. We're a production engineering team. Uh, and for those of you who don't know those words, that's probably the same thing as what you've heard SRE called, or close enough. Uh, and production engineering is kind of a somewhat software engineering, somewhat uh, systems kind of role. And we are the team that's focused on managing the sort of OS as a platform. Uh, so we manage what we call the bare metal experience. And what that means is we provide APIs by a chef for various different service centers around the company who own physical hardware still to customize their machines, whether that be by setting up services, setting <coughs> syscuddles, uh, doing whatever it is that they need doing. Uh, but we provide that as a, as a platform, right? So if you own 5,000 machines somewhere in the data center as a service owner, because that's where your service runs, it's your responsibility to keep those machines healthy, keep Chef running, and we have a monitoring system that will page you when you don't do that. So the idea is, is that we spread the load as much as possible, so we're a very small team. Uh, the original OS team was four people, uh, despite the fact that we had a huge fleet, and we were able to do this. The team's about nine people now, only because we've taken on uh, other responsibilities. But the idea is to shard the actual workout to the people who own the machines. So the team has an upstream first philosophy, which is we are not the only team at Facebook that has one, uh, but it is really important to us. The idea is, is we want to work with the community to help set the long-term direction. And it turns out, uh, if you've ever worked in an open source uh, group, uh, open source project, or started your own, the last thing you want is a big blue company coming and telling you what your long-term direction should be. So the way you do this, uh, if you happen to uh, be in the position of working for a large company, is you send some small bug fixes. And then you show up to conferences, like this one. Um, and you talk to the developers, and you build a relationship, and you got beers, and you have food together, and you do those sorts of things. And then at some point, when you send a big feature uh, change, or some other thing, you have a relationship to, to, as a base to discuss, hey, this is why you want to do this, this is why we think it's good for the software, the community. And you do that more and more, they get to know what you want and you get to know what they want. And so when big changes, uh, discussions about big changes come up, you get to be part of the discussion and you talk about ways to make sure that the future is both compatible with what you want and, what, what, and with what they want. We move fast. We move really, really fast. Faster than any other big company I've ever worked for and any other small company I've ever worked for. And I've worked for plenty of them. However, we have to deploy all of our changes to a lot of the machines. Uh, and we aren't always working on just one project, which means open source often moves faster. Um, so we really want to leverage that speed. And it turns out that we don't actually want to write everything ourselves. I've worked for other big companies, I won't name, uh, who like to think that if they write it themselves, it'll be better. Uh, we do not suffer from that particular predilection. We would like to benefit from all of the intelligence and capability of all of the other people in the world and be able to contribute back to that. So on the topic of contributing back to that, uh, when we want to write features or fixes for other software, uh, we want to, uh, the, the joy of contributing that back is that we get to share in the maintenance, right? This is the standard open source thing, this isn't a surprise to any of you. Um, if we contribute a feature or fix, then other people use it, other people maintain it, and we get to share the burden. We gave a talk about this upstream philosophy, how we got into it, and how we maintain it. Uh, at DevConf, uh, David and I both gave the talk. At DevConf CC 2017, there's a link there. If you care, it goes into much more detail. So then, Getting to the crux of all this, uh, we run CentOS on our entire fleet, uh, modular few max that we'll talk about later. So we get the question all the time of why do we use CentOS? Well, the reason we use it is, well, there are many reasons we use it. Uh, one of them is the lower releases are nice. Um, but that's actually not a huge reason. A much bigger reason for us is binary compatibility. So we do uh, continue rolling updates on physical hardware because that is really, really nice and easy. Um, and being able to do that without having to move workloads or stop and start workloads or worrying about workloads crashing is really, really, really nice. And even if you don't, in our case, most of our workloads are not using the OS runtime, we still don't want, say, SSH crashing or, or, or whatever else. 
Um, and we had security updates, also really lovely. And the binary compatibility means that we can roll up those security updates nearly instantaneously. There's mature and well understood tooling, so when we hire people, they know what the fuck's going on, which is great. Uh, we have Apple, which means that when REL ecosystem is too old or doesn't have the right tooling, chances are Apple probably has it. Also really nice. And one of the biggest benefits we get is that it's part of the, it's in the same ecosystem as Fedora. So there's a lot of stuff that we'll talk about in just a second that we want to move really fast on. And so we can backport stuff from Fedora Rawhide. And because it's the same ecosystem, we don't have to figure out how to package it from scratch. We take a Fedora Rawhide source RPM, we make some tweaks, we rebuild it, and then voila, we have new stuff on Rel, or on well, CentOS, which is great. So let's talk about that. This is roughly what our OS looks like. Um, we have a whole ton of packages. We'll call it 95% of our OS that like, we don't really care all that much about. We're not following it in detail. It just needs to exist. I don't care if I have the latest and greatest LS. I don't care if I have the latest and greatest top. But I do need an LS, and I do need a top to exist, right? Not to be confused with a top. Um, but there's a handful of packages we really, really want to follow uh, the bleeding edge of, either because we're developing on them and submitting pull requests to like 15-year-old versions of software is not generally considered a good idea. Um, or just because we want the latest and greatest features uh, and because of whatever reason. So in our case, that's uh, these are some examples, uh, RPM system D, Yum, Dia. We backport these from Fedora Rawhide and run them on top of CentOS 7. We call that our fast thin layer and all of the changes required to do that are on our GitHub repo that you can see up there. Uh, this is my, mostly low-level plumbing uh, and tooling and that sort of stuff. Um, although occasionally someone will say, hey, I really need the latest screen or, or whatever. Um, but we, when we backport the stuff, almost always, it's just changes to spec files. It's really, really small. Um, it's very rare that we actually have to patch the source itself. And it just works. And people actually build these RPMs all the time and use them, and it's kind of amazing. We have a percent Facebook macro, which we use for like the things we want to do. So for example, if we want to change a configure option to a piece of software, um, we, you as a random user may not want to then rebuild that software and get different defaults from what you get in Fedora. So we guard that behind a percent Facebook macro. Other examples are Facebook specific things like, hey, we want to set the default NDP server or whatever. Um, this base of CentOS plus this fast thin layer of Fedora Rawhide gives us the ability to have a really stable OS that we don't have to put much effort into, but also be able to move as fast as we want anywhere else, which is really, really beneficial to us. So as Phil mentioned, one of the things we try to track closely is systemd. And we started looking at systemd when we started looking at CentOS 7, because as you know, CentOS 7 shipped with systemd by default. Now, CentOS 7 shipped with a pretty old version of systemd, even when the disco was originally released. CentOS 7 shipped with systemd 219, and when we started looking at this, we realized pretty early that there were a lot of things in systemd that were being actively developed, that we were interested in playing with, we were interested in using, and we didn't necessarily want to go to the trouble of backporting everything back to 219, and then dealing with, oh, you're finding my reports on a really old version, I'm saying it's not going to be happy, and stuff like that. So we made a decision to try and run something close to master. Now, luck would have it that that's already in our app. Rawhide packages the last system is stable, and usually whenever a string tags are released, Rawhide gets updated in a matter of days. So we just took that, we backported the package from Rawhide, uh, <coughs> and we started it up in that repo that Phil mentioned before, and it works fine, and now we're on system D 239 right now on the fleet, and we'll probably update to 241 soon enough. Um, one thing we hit during this was the backwarding system itself wasn't a big deal. Uh, however, between 2.19 and 2.30, uh, upstream, upstream system D changed the way the uh, deep system D data source are built and packaged. So to deal with this, because we didn't want to reveal the 20 of packages in the archive that relied on this, we made a small package called system D compound lips that just provides the old SOs with links to the new ones, so you can run things like Apache and just install it without having to rebuild it. That's also open source on that on that repo, it's a very simple project. This lets us, this makes us able to track upstream development very closely. So there's a lot of features in systemd that we're interested in. There's a lot of things we are either following upstream development on or that we're actively contributing. Uh, some example is we do a lot of work internally around C group two, and a lot of the direction in general for C group two is driven by people that have it work for Facebook. Uh, so we, over the years, we have contributed a bunch of signature-related features to systemd and backported patches in. And being able to do this on master 
is a lot more pleasant and a lot easier both for us and for the community. Uh, another recent example, we, we do also a lot of work around DPF. One thing uh, we contributed to systemd was support for the Cgroups device controller that uses Cgroup 2, and that's an implementation that actually uses BPF under the hood. Um, and other recent features that we are looking at is portable services, uh, which is uh, quite compelling, especially for building composable systems where you can use the same service on both bare metal and containers. Uh, at Facebook, we manage our machines using Chef. Uh, we have a number of cookbooks that we've open sourced that are available on GitHub on Facebook Chef Cookbooks. For systemd specifically, we have two cookbooks. Uh, Happy systemd takes care of installing and managing systemd itself, uh, both systemd the package and also the config files. And then we have a cookbook to manage systemd timers that provides a user-friendly API. And we wrote this internally to make it easier for people to leverage timers and maybe try and move away from cron jobs. Uh, I gave a talk that goes in depth about what we do with systemd at all systems go, and I also gave previous talks. That's the link to the most recent one that has links to the old talks. Now, if you run systemd, you also have to run DBUS. Uh, DBUS is what systemd uses for local IPC on machines and to expose uh, API for other tools to access things inside systemd. Uh, we, one thing that's important to note about DBUS is that if DBUS goes haywire on a machine or becomes unhealthy, systemd gets pretty sad. And in general, you don't really want to run a machine in production where DBUS is significantly unhealthy. Uh, CentOS runs DBus Daemon, we also run DBus Daemon, we don't run the version that's in CentOS, we run a backport uh, because a couple of years ago we found a bunch of fixes that we wanted from Fedora. Uh, we don't, however, track it that closely. We've also started testing DBus Broker, which is a new implementation uh, of, a, of a DBus management daemon thing. Uh, DBus Broker looks good, it's currently deployed on about 100 machines and we haven't had any major issues. We would like to deploy this further. However, a problem we have with both Divas Demon and Divas Broker is that neither of, neither of them can be safely upgraded or restarted. Actually, for Divas Demon, if you talk to Upstream, Upstream will tell you that you're not supposed to restart Divas Demon or upgrade it, you should just reboot your machine, which for servers is not ideal. Um, so especially for something that we would like to try closely, that's kind of a problem because we can't necessarily reboot the whole fleet at once when we have to update Divas. With that said, systemd is pretty good at recovering in this situation. Uh, so this isn't always a showstopper. As I mentioned, DBus also exposes APIs. We would like to use these APIs for systemd because they make it possible to do <coughs> things like start and stop units without having to shout out to systemctl. To that end, you have to speak over the bus. There are a lot of APIs to talk to DBus. Uh, we decided to use as DBus, which is the one that's packaged with systemd, partly because it's packaged with systemd, so there's no added dependencies, partly because it works, uh, which is a nice side effect. Uh, we wrote a Python wrapper for this uh, called PythonD. Uh, this uses Python to just call in into the C API from Python. Uh, we did this because some of the things we wanted to do are from Python, because a lot of the infrastructure stuff at Facebook is in Python. Uh, this is open source, it's on GitHub at that repo. This also adds some sugar, which makes it easy to do things like get an object that represents a unit and do stuff on it without having to remember how to craft Dbus incantations. Uh, another package that we have a vested interest in is Inscripts. And if you're not aware of Inscripts, it's the package that provides the contents of etc init.d on your Fedora or RAM machine or CentOS machine. It also contains something called Network Scripts, which is what provides etc init.d networking, and etc is this config Network Scripts. Network Scripts is the thing that used to manage the network in like CentOS 5. Uh, it's what we use to manage the network, and we still use it even now, even though with 7, the default thing to manage the network would be Network Manager. We do this partly because over the years we accumulated a lot of knowledge and fixes and hooks built around it. Uh, partly because it just works and it's bash, so it's pretty easy to work with. Uh, so over the years we made a lot of fixes around IPv6. We added support for pre-device routes. We improved the way in, in downing interfaces is managed. We added config options. Uh, all of this is upstream. Uh, we contributed it to that repo, which is the Fedora upstream. In production, we don't run that code straight up uh, because the packaging for Inkscape between CentOS and Fedora is quite different. So we run the CentOS package, but we backport the entirety of network scripts from the master so we can get our fixes going, which is nice. Uh, finally, let's talk about the kernel. Uh, we have a kernel team at Facebook, which is distinct from our team, which is the OS team. Uh, but the kernel team also has the same general approach to the community. So the kernel team deploys an upstream kernel in production. We try to stay as close as possible to Linux is 3. All the development work that our kernel engineers do is done in master. They will send patches on LTML, and then later on, this will be backported internally so that they, they're deployed in production. 
We usually have two to three ongoing kernel branches on the fleet, like a all stable, stable, next kind of setup. Uh, and we have a lot of tooling to move machines from one kernel version to another, to do automated testing, to check for regressions. Uh, as you might imagine, running the kernel isn't as trivial, partly because you need to reboot, which again is expensive, uh, partly because the kernel can have a lot of like wide ranging implications around performance and stuff. Um, my colleague Yannick gave a talk uh, at scale a couple of years ago, and you can find there that talks in detail about the infrastructure we have for testing our rollouts. So let's talk a little bit about packaging. So this is going to look kind of similar to the talk that was in this room a half an hour ago, but that's okay. So uh, we mirror the entirety of CentOS both internally and externally. If you want an external mirror, you can find it there. Uh, I can give you internal URLs, but it wouldn't help you very much. Um, and then we uh, we try to mirror these repos identically, which means we don't mess with the metadata, we don't rebuild the metadata, we don't add or remove packages from those repos. We treat them as just like black box objects, which we can we can import. However, we do have internal repos um, where we uh, where we put our own software. We have a bajillion of them, but basically they fall into two categories. We have site packages, which is stuff built against the OS runtime, the OS libc. So if we wanted to, I don't know, rebuild uh, SSH, uh, it would go in there. Any of our own stuff that we need to add to the OS goes in there. And then we have FB runtime. So we have an internal runtime that all Facebook services are built against. So it's its own libc and its own stack of stuff. Uh, all of those packages get dropped in an FB runtime repo. These are the two main repos. <coughs> so our packages are stored in cluster. Um, and they are served in each region by Apache with a boatload of varnish caches in front of them. Uh, and then we have some local CLIs that can talk to a publisher and say, hey, here's a new package, please publish it to this repo. Uh, and that publisher can do a variety of checks. This scales incredibly well for us, um, and it's pretty simple. It uses standard software, uh, and it propagates much faster than our previous solutions if you saw any of our other talks. This is kind of the new version. It, like The publishing happens in uh, a few minutes globally, which is really nice. So this is a picture of the words I just said. Um, so if we go into a little bit more detail here, you can see in the upper left, uh, package publishing tools, which David is going to talk about in just a second, are tools that can do the builds of these various pieces of software. We'll submit the jobs to build it, builders, do the building, and then afterwards submit them to the publisher to request to be published. And the publisher is a fairly complex piece of software. Uh, it does a whole bunch of things. Uh, one thing it does is send it checks. Is your package signed, for example? Do you have permission to publish to this repo, et cetera, et cetera. Once it does all of that, it then does starts on the actual publishing process, which may include things like uh, updating the repo metadata, um, and then we'll eventually copy those RPMs out to the various cluster volumes across the world. It's pretty smart. It knows all of our internal magic, so it can do things like check to see if regions are online um, or offline and know whether or not it needs to talk to them. Uh, if it cannot talk to a region, either because it's formally offline or just because it happens to not be there, uh, it keeps redo logs, and we'll try again later. So it's, it's quite smart. Uh, and then it does things like log, uh, log to internal logging systems and publish stats to internal stat systems so we can monitor it easily. Once it's in Gluster, um, uh, it's, uh, Apache uh, gets access to it, our RenFS, and then we have a bunch of varnish caches that make it available to the actual young clients themselves. Um, because Varnish doesn't support HTTPS, uh, I didn't put it on here, but basically we have Nginx in front of Varnish, but because we also occasionally serve local data, there's also the case where uh, Nginx may talk to Varnish, which may not to Nginx, because technology sucks. So as Phil mentioned, we have two kinds of packages. System, question? Uh, yeah, uh, do you have an idea of how many text end-to-end to the end to, uh, So from the moment you publish or the moment you want to build, or? The moment you publish. Okay, so from the moment we publish to the moment it's available to all clients on the YUM servers uh, is usually under two minutes at this point. Um, it can vary a little bit based on stuff. Um, and then we run Chef every 15 minutes with a 15 minutes play, so your change affects globally the world, assuming you haven't added some logic to slow this down, which is also possible, within about half an hour. Uh, as Phil mentioned, we have two kinds of packages, system packages and API packages, and we have tooling to make it easy for our engineers to work and build with these packages. So for system packages, we have a thing called Yummy. And Yummy is a simple wrapper around Mock. If you're not familiar with Mock, Mock is an upstream tool that's part of Fedora, the Sandbox, and Rail that just builds packages in a short. So <coughs> we use Mock. Uh, we keep our spec files and our source code patches in, in our source control repo. We then keep tarballs in a <coughs> FS, which happens to be backed by Gluster here. 
Yami takes all this together, feeds it to mock, gets back our RPM artifacts, and these are your packages. Uh, developers will do this on their developer machines so they can iteratively build their packages. Then when it's time to actually publish them, they will still use Yami to submit them to a central build system that does the exact same thing, but in a more controlled fashion. And at the end of it, it signs the packages with a special key that allows them to be published. Uh, we also have automation that allows us to sync code from internal repos to GitHub. This isn't specific to RPMs. So it's a tool called Shipit that you can find on GitHub if you care. Uh, we use this to populate that RPM backports repo that Phil mentioned for the packages that we, we publish on GitHub. Uh, now that was for system packages. Uh, system packages that are used as CentOS, GPC, and everything. For Facebook runtime packages, things are different. Facebook runtime packages are ex essentially self-contained. They use our libc, our compiler, and so on. Uh, they're built with our build system, generally speaking, which is Buck, which is also open source, but it's just a build system. So we have a tool called Pacman that reads a little YAML file that tells it how to build a thing and what are the artifacts. And then from that, it generates a stack file and uses it to build an RPM with RPM build, and then it's done. We do this because this makes it very easy for people that don't necessarily know or care about stack files and RPMs to get their software deployed in production. But again, people can do builds on their development machines or they can send them off to the cloud to get them done officially and then publish that. On the client side, well, of course we run RPM. Uh, we run a version of RPM that's backported from Fedora. Uh, we run 4.14 right now. Uh, we do this because we, on one side, we, we like some of the fixes that have been done upstream in RPM. On the other, we are actively working with RPM upstream to test new features, uh, and we'll talk about this in a second. For YAM itself, we run YAM, the YAM from CentOS, uh, unmodified, but we do run a backport of YAM utils because there were a few PRs in uh, master, mostly around package cleanup that we wanted to have internally. Uh, we also have the NF deployed everywhere on the fleet. It's not used by default, but it's there and people can use it. Um, the NF is built currently from the YAM4 repos, but we really hope to be able to move to our OHI build soon uh, for better compatibility with modularity. As well. <coughs> uh, editing as Facebook is managed by Chef. This is no exception. We have two cookbooks, FBRPM and FBYAM. FBRPM manages RPM itself, both RPM the package, and it also drops config files with default macros and things like that. It's open source, you can find it on GitHub. FBYAM manages YAM and DNF. It also has logic to generate yam.conf and dnf.conf and what repos you should get, what stage of the OS upgrade process you're in, and things like that. This is pretty specific to our infra and is not currently open source. Now let's talk a bit about RPM and DNF at scale specifically. So I mentioned we work closely with RPM upstream. An example of something we worked on a while ago was adding support for calling F-Sync on close. Uh, on a, with RPM, if you're installing a large RPM, like a multi-gigabyte one, which unfortunately happens, uh, that will take up all the I.O. while it's being installed. And when <coughs> RPM is doing all the I.O., other things on the box, say MySQL, get none of the I.O., which is not great if your box is supposed to run MySQL. So we added support for calling F-Sync when your close files, when RPM closes file, which solves this problem if you're running on an SSD. Uh, Phil prototyped the feature, sent a PR, there was a bunch of back and forth with upstream on this. In the end, upstream merged a feature that did roughly the same but with a different implementation. So it's there, you can use it, it's behind the gate, because again, if you don't have an SSD, this will end very poorly. Uh, but that's an example of something that we were able to iterate fast with upstream on because we had the ability to run code from master essentially on production machines and give fast feedback. Uh, other interesting things that happen if you run RPM at scale, uh, RPM database corruption issues that you might hit from time to time if you have a small number of machines. You end up hitting all the time when you have a large number of machines. Uh, generally speaking, if you have a large number of machines, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So you, you will get these kind of issues on a lot of boxes. We wrote a tool for this called ECRPM. Talk about it in a minute. Another issue you can encounter is duplicate packages, uh, which generally arise from incomplete YAM transactions. For that, the, the fix is called in package cleanup. We have a pretty horrific wrapper around package cleanup in Bash that runs it, drives the output, figures out the feature role for us on backwards, and then does the thing. Uh, this is not open source yet because it's really embarrassing. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, as I mentioned, because we have a lot of machines, we always look for ways to make things work better. Uh, one thing we did for YAM was add a plugin to YAM to package torrent that uses a BitTorrent transport. So on the clients, instead of uh, getting the files over HTTP, it asks for a torrent, gets the torrent, downloads it with BitTorrent. 
this is the added benefit that if you have a lot of machines doing the same package downloads at the same time, it's a bit darned. It's designed for that. Um, this is uh, this was sent as a PR and it's currently merged upstream in the Amutils. Uh, now, this ERPM. So, this ERPM is the thing we wrote to automate detection and remediation of common issues. This boils down to calling DB4 Verify. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, RPM uses Berkeley DB. Berkeley DB is interesting. Uh, it has a lot of things that can go wrong. It has a lot of indexes and locking and stuff. So, what this would do is do what a human would do when it goes on the box. So, it would call DB4 Verify, then DB4 Recover, then look for any processes holding locks. <coughs> That sh they shouldn't be holding or any logs being held by processes that aren't there anymore and generally clean these up. Uh, this runs on Linux and on OS X uh, because yes, we do have production machines on OS X. Uh, we have a small core of Mac minis for doing um, iOS app builds. These of course don't run CentOS, uh, but they do run Chef for config management and they do run RPM and YAM for software installs and they get broken RPM databases occasionally, so we have DC RPM on them to fix them. Uh, we run this thing in a hook before we run Chef on every box in the fleet because it turns out Chef works a lot better if it's able to install packages. Uh, you could also run this in Corona on a timer. The idea is that you'd run this periodically to keep things healthy. Uh, it's open source, it's written in Python. You can find it there if you'd like to play with it. Uh, this shows you the before and after. There are no X's on that because lawyers, uh, but it's like time stuff. Before this ERPM, a lot of stuff was happening. After, there's a lot less stuff happening. There's still a small baseline of errors. Part of that is broad categories of things we know about, but we don't, we haven't managed to fix in automation yet. Part of that is sometimes machines are just too broken, and it doesn't make sense to automate the fixing, just give up on them, which is fine. We have a lot of them. Uh, things we're currently working on. We would really like to rewrite that horrible package cleanup wrapper in Python and put it in the CRPM, because it would fit well with the rest of the tooling there. Uh, we are working with upstream RPM in testing new database formats to replace BerkeleyDB. <coughs> upstream has two new database formats, one based on LMDB, one called NDB, which is a purpose-built uh, database format. We just finished building infrastructure to test this in production in a way that can give us useful signal. We are hoping to get this deployed on like a few hundred machines each, so that we can go back to upstream and tell them this works better or worse, here are what the issues are, so we can help them make an informed choice on what might become a future default or whatever. Uh, also, this has the added benefit that if this does pan out, maybe we don't need the CRPM anymore. That would be nice. Uh, we are also testing the CR, uh, DNF in production. We haven't done any major testing of DNF in production yet, uh, apart from it's there and it mostly works. Uh, we do know that the last version of DNF is much better perf than the other ones, which is nice, but we are hoping to get actual metrics and numbers and feedback soon. All right, let's talk a little bit about how we do OS updates. So <clears throat> there's major OS updates and minor of OS updates. Um, let's start with major OS updates, so like 5 to 6, 6 to 7. I've been at Facebook for a really long time because I'm old, so I've been there a little over 8 years. And when I got there, the fleet was mostly CentOS 5. Uh, but there was still some Fedora Core 4. We didn't upgrade them, we just killed that data center. And before that, I'm sure we were running whatever was in Zuck's uh, basement. So. Uh, we do not do in-place upgrades for major OS upgrades. Uh, we do do in-place updates for literally everything else that we ever want to touch, but not major OS upgrades. We do this for a couple reasons. One is uh, it's a good time to get a clean slate uh, and not have to worry about things. Um, but the other is that um, there's often side effects where we, we can kind of take this as an opportunity to think about where we are and what we want to be doing. So for example, the Sun 6 to Sun 7 upgrade, we had to move all of our you know, sysvnet scripts to unit files. Uh, it was kind of a good opportunity to stop and go, well, if we're going to swap out our init system and our process supervision system, let's look and see what we have. Oh, look, we have Runit, and we have this, and we have that, and we have 97 other ways of uh, supervising process. People who wrote cron jobs to like, restart their fucking services all the time. So we thought, well, this is a great opportunity to just be like, nope, we're going to kill all of that. And everyone will move to system D, and we'll have one init system, and that will be great. So we use this as sort of a, a, a flag day to kill all, all the crap we don't want to have uh, happen. So the 5 to 6 upgrade was before there was an OS team. Uh, so it was kind of done haphazardly by a handful of engineers who were like, hey, man, this Sun 5 stuff is too old. We want to do something new. Um, and they kind of half pushed people to move. And by the time we built an OS team, um, so we still had a whole bunch of Sun 5 around. So the first thing we did was actually go and yell at all the people still running Sun 5, get them over to Sun 6. 
A few years later, we started working on Sun7, and we made that kind of an actual proper project. And let's talk about that a little bit. So the way we managed to make Sun7 a bigger, better, more successful project was managing in the same way that we manage all of the other things around machines at Facebook. If you own machines, it's your responsibility to do the upgrade. Um, the OS team started by doing a proof of concept. We built, a note, we built a machine that had CentOS 7, we got all of the chef code working, we got all the APIs working, we figured out what, what all of the gotchas were, what, all the, what things had to be converted, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, we moved an actual like web server onto it and proved that it could be done. It was about a year from there until the first actual production machine was serving traffic, and about two years before the entire fleet was moved. Um, so the way we managed to make this successful was we provided copious documentation and automation to the rest of the company. Uh, so for example, we had tutorials on how to write unit files. We had like a list of gotchas all the way down to, hey, when you run Netcat, the options have changed. Uh, all sorts of crazy things, uh, as well as automation around, hey, feed this list of machines in, and we will re-image them at your rates and like, handle all of that stuff for you. Um, and that worked out pretty well. Um, the stateless services, as you might imagine, were pretty easy. Uh, people had to do all the upfront work to make sure it worked, but then feed machines to the glue factory and magic happens. Stateful systems, as you might imagine, were a little more difficult. Uh, but we planned on that. We talked to all of the storage services ahead of time. We asked them how long it would take to like do all of the data stuff and yada, 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 and we kind of made the timelines in accordance with that data. Unfortunately, uh, it turns out storage services are not all alike. So for a MySQL database, it's pretty easy to say, well, we have, we have to make sure that the replica is up to date before we image this machine or whatever, and that's fine. Data warehouse is a little different. So for example, if you have a data warehouse that has three copies of a block, and you want to re-image a machine, uh, all of the other machines that have some of those blocks go, oh, shit, I need to replicate all this, and you make a bunch of network traffic and a bunch of I.O. and a bunch of CPU. And I'm like, that's not so bad if you have one of them, but if we want to do more than one machine at a time, which are a number of machines we can, like if we did one machine at a time, it would never finish. All of a sudden, you're doing multiple machines at a time, and you're taking all the CPU and all this I.O. and all this network that like actual customers of the data warehouse would like. So, in order to accomplish that, what the storage teams wanted to do was actually go the other way and say, well, what if we can re-image a machine and then have it come back with its data before the cluster notices? So that meant two things. One was us optimizing the install process very significantly to be faster. And the other was helping them have hooks in the automation so that they could do things like change the timeouts on block life uh, before they image the machine. Uh, and then change it back. So there was a handful of work that we had to do that we didn't really expect to do. The other thing that we ran into that was kind of interesting was there were prereqs that we knew about that ended up bringing in dependencies at the 11th hour, which we were not expecting. So for example, uh, as David mentioned, when we started with CentOS 7, we were using basically Bleeding Edge System D for the time. Bleeding Edge System D required a pretty new kernel. So we were also forcing people to upgrade to a new branch of the kernel. Well, that all seemed fine and well. Uh, went well with the stateful services. And then stateful services came along and went, oh, well, I upgraded 10% of the machines in this cluster and XFS seems to be much slower. Like, ah, oh, crap. Uh, so then it's like, well, let's get a kernel engineer to go look at that and see what they can do, except, of course, what they did was they re everything back to Sense 6 because they couldn't handle the performance regression. So then there was nothing for the kernel engineer to look at, and as you can see, this goes on for a while. Uh, eventually, we did get kernel engineers that could get on a box that was having a problem fix the problem, push the problem upstream, rebuild a new kernel, start the whole thing over. It takes a long time. So this was the biggest delay that we had. Uh, I will say that a couple of these were actually not kernel problems. They were like, you know, tunable problems. This is cuddle change, this is cuddle, or whatever. Uh, but there were actual kernel changes that had to happen, uh, and that slowed us down pretty significantly. Minor releases and rolling releases, we treat the same. So <clears throat> we don't give a shit if it goes 7.1 to 7.2, or if we just downloaded a bunch of new updates. We treat them identically. Um, in fact, it doesn't really, like, it shouldn't actually matter, right? So what we do is we download the entirety of the CentOS updates directory every two-ish weeks. Um, if we need to update the, download the base directory, we will do that as well. Um, we do some testing, and then we roll out that entire update over the course of the fleet for about another two weeks. And the way it looks is we download it to a data directory, like so, uh, and then we have tools that automate this downloading and syncing and testing and yada, yada, yada. And then effectively, we can kick off a YUM upgrade. Uh, there's a little asterisk there, because running a YUM upgrade on a production server is kind of dumb. So we pass in a bajillion flags that are like minus, minus exclude repo all of our internal repos, because we obviously don't want to upgrade that, as well as every package that we manually maintain. 
So for example, system D, we don't want to try and upgrade that, so we exclude it in the event that somehow upstream happened to get a new upgrade. Uh, then our way of rolling this out is the same way we roll out most major changes at Facebook, which is a canary system with a rolling update. So you start on some very small number of machines, like a tenth of a percent, then they roll to 1%, and 2%, and 3%, 4%, and so on and so forth. We have a system for um, service owners to opt in to pre-roll it. So you can say, hey, I want these 20 machines to get all of this uh, two days before the rollout begins so that I can say, hey, yo, you're going to break me. Um, but because of ABI compatibility, this basically never happens. I mean, people do opt in, but we almost never break people. Um, and so then over two weeks, we ramp up that rollout from point one to one to two to five to ten to whatever, uh, and then we're done, and then we rinse and repeat. Now let's talk about what happens next. The number coming after seven has been shrouded in mystery for quite a while, but then the rally created a drop. So this time we decided to try something different. Usually we wouldn't really start looking at a new sentence version until it's been out for a while, and that's what happened for six and for seven. For eight, we started having a look at the beta, and we realized it could it could be used as a nice way to get a preview of what CentOS would look like. Now, Red and CentOS aren't exactly the same, of course, but for the stuff we care about, especially for an early bring up, they're close enough, because we mostly care about low-level systems, this stuff. So I picked a handful of non-production testing machines and somehow got the Relic beta on them. Uh, and by a handful, I literally mean less than five machines. And it works. Like, these don't do any kind of useful work, as you might imagine, but I do have at least a couple of machines that are able to run Chef from start to finish without barfing, which is nice. Uh, and I have to say, it's fine. Like, I was expecting to have to do a lot more work to get this going. So far, it's, been, it's not been a big deal. There are, of course, some issues. Uh, the package list on the 8 beta is significantly trained, and a bunch of software we use to rely on isn't there. So, for example, we use NTPD. NTPD is not there. There's kernel instead. That's fine, we can just backport it from Fedora. It's not, that kind of stuff isn't the problem. Um, what this gives us the possibility to get though is, outside of that, which is easy, is getting a head start on potential significant issues that we might find. So we can either go to upstream and have a conversation about it, or if something is a change that requires engineering work internally, I can know in advance and have teams around the company plan their roadmaps around it, which is helpful, instead of getting a surprise. Now the main new thing is DNF, of course. Uh, DNF is also shipped as YAM4. We will not use the YAM4 part because by the time we will have 8, we'll just have everything moved over to DNF because we think that's the right thing to do. The main new thing with DNF is modularity, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, we also found out that this seems faster, especially with the last batch of updates. DNF seems faster, but I don't have hard numbers right now, but that's nice. Uh, we have full support for 18 Chef. We work quite a bit with Chef the company to get this merged for the package provider and things like that. Uh, also, it looks like DNF has better tooling and support for duplicate packages, which is nice. Maybe I can get rid of that horrible shell script. Uh, one, thing we, one thing we don't have is uh, package torrent yet, because the API from DNF and YAM is completely different. DNF actually, actually has two plugin APIs instead of one. So we'll have to figure that out, but for five machines, I don't really need that. So I can do it later. Now, modularity is awesome. Modularity lets you have multiple versions of a given package in the repo, and then you can figure out, do I want my SQL version 5 or 6 or whatever. Uh, however, we had interesting surprises with this. First time I got the machines up and running, I was like, where is our MySQL? We have an FB MySQL package that provides all the MySQL and all the MariaDB packages. And that was definitely in the repo, definitely in the metadata, not at all in DNF search or DNF list available. So after talking to some smart people at DEF CONF last week, we found out that when you have a module that contains some packages, the module wins over the packages, and the packages are shadowed. So we fixed this by just disabling the module for now for MySQL, and then our packages are magically back. And Phil actually wrote an API for this in FBM, so we can do this in a sane way. The real fix here is to build our MySQL as a module clearly. Uh, so that's some work that we will do with the database team internally, so we can fix this nicely. But that's a good example of something that I, I'm very happy to have found out now, because I can plan a little <coughs> rather than having to run when set 8 comes out and have to fix it with. Right. So CentOS is our friend, uh, which is the cheesiest thing I've ever said on stage. Uh, <laughs> CentOS has a really great community, uh, and it has a much bigger community now that that big wall inside of Red Hat is starting to come down. 
uh, which is great. We've met a lot of this community over the past couple of years as we've gone to more and more dev comps and now CentOS dojos. It's part of the Fedora Red Hat family, which is a big deal to us um, because, as I said, we get these benefits from uh, RHEL, like ABI compatibility, but we also get to backport Fedora stuff when and, we, when and if we want, which means that we get to support ourselves, which is what we want to do. We have lots of engineers, we can handle that, but we also get to move as slow or as fast as we want and mix and match things as we want, which is really nice. And it turns out, out of like weird coincidence, we're not the only people who want to do this, so this whole modularity thing seems to have a logical conclusion somewhere in the realm of people being able to do what we already do today. So it'd be really cool one day if, and it seems likely, you could just say, hey, I'd like the system D from Fedora on my CentOS box, and magic happens because it's already compiled that way. So it seems like things are moving in a direction that makes it even easier for us to share what we're doing with the rest of the world, uh, and have the rest of the world kind of do similar or compatible things. So uh, like the TLDR here is CentOS makes all of this lovely and easy. So we have uh, about five-ish minutes left. We're going to take your questions, and while we do, we have this nice slide with all of the URLs because sometimes URLs are hard to remember, so now you can take a picture and you have them all. Questions? Yeah, I'm back, Blue. Um, Mike, uh, which version do you use? And I remember that uh, a while ago I saw a patch from Facebook to MySQL my 5.6 about no log. <coughs> and skip log files or skip log rows. So we have a repo on GitHub yeah. that has our MySQL fork. Um, it is a MySQL fork largely because contributing back to MySQL is virtually impossible. Yeah. Um, and uh, also our, we, our MySQL basically is RocksDB, so it's MySQL at Facebook is largely the protocol and not, the, not any of the storage engines. Okay. Um, you're welcome to go see it there. Uh, that's our version of MySQL. Uh, where do you use portable services, or are you using them already? So we we are not using the implementation of portable services in systemd just yet, but we are using the technologies that build portable services for doing things like composable services in containers. So for example, having, having an easy way to attach sidecar services that are self-contained to a container. What we would like to have at some point is that the ability to using portable services as they are to build services in a way that they can deploy on both bare metal and container unmodified. Because uh, that would make it very easy for people to move back and forth as they need to. Uh, we also have a bunch of services that we call like wallet binaries that do like, I don't know, service discovery, for example, that can be useful sometimes to run in either one or the other. So this would save a bunch of work for people. Yep. Hey, you play with Podman and what's your take on Podman? Do you have anything to say? As far as I know, no one is playing uh, Podman here. No, I'm not aware of anybody using Podman. Sorry. <laughs> it's why. Yeah, what's up? So, are you using, uh, you are one of the main contributors of Open Compute, so you are, um, I, I was not here at the beginning, so you said uh, uh, hundred of thousands of servers, is it it's the number? So no. that, that's not what we're allowed to say, uh, and yeah, it's all Open Compute. Yeah. Uh, all Open Compute? Yes, yes. Uh, all of the... Yeah, all, all of the hardware that is in production and all of the hardware we make and we will make is open compute hardware. There may be occasionally pockets of experiments that are not open compute, but generally speaking, we want everything production each to be open compute. I think someone will find some, some uh, Facebook servers on eBay uh, recently. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But it's not open compute, this one. Well, you. I mean, there was a time before yeah. open compute, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, but I mean, that's a really long time ago. I mean, just to give you a, a perspective, the first open compute hardware was deployed into Facebook about seven-ish years ago. So, like that hardware, you should like the pre-open compute hardware. You probably don't want to use. It's yeah. Real. Even the early open compute hardware, you I would not want to run that at home. But yeah, you can definitely find it on eBay. Also, the company that's selling the old open compute hardware, apparently. Yeah, I mean, they're. <laughs> There's a lot of it. To be clear, they scrap it before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On just what is uh, an average configuration with a memory on the of, on the CPU of one one server oh. with, uh, with it? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't follow the question. The, the an average configuration for perhaps yeah. it's different for data and for uh, specs. Oh, I mean, they, they range dramatically. Yeah. Right? So like you can go see them on the site, but we have you know anything from a few hard drives and a few gigs of memory to like. 100 gigs of memory and you know dozens of hard drives. So like it, it entirely depends. Actual numbers on production things are sort of sensitive. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, 
on the uh, RTS backend, uh, you, you said that you are starting to experiment with the uh, so yeah, so there's LMDB, uh, which is the standard LMDB you've heard of, and then there's NDB, which is it stands for Native Database. It was written by SUSE actually, um, because they got sick of BDB and then got ported to uh, Red Hat's RPM because they SUSE has their own fork of RPM, um, and the RPM developers at, at Red Hat are justifiably scared of changing the default, um, and we were like, hey, we can throw this on a thousand machines and tell you what happens, and they were like, that'd be great. So at the moment, it's on one machine uh, as of two days ago. Uh, it took us, we had to get RPM 4 and 4 out. Um, so that's kind of where we are. The, the goal is to get it on a few hundred machines, get some numbers, both performance and reliability, hand it back to RPM, and then have a discussion about what's next. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, a colleague of ours who used to work at Facebook, um, who I picked up that project from, wrote a little test harness that tried to start a transaction uh, and kill minus nine it in a loop as fast as it could go on all three database formats. Um, and it was like two to three seconds before BDB got corrupted and he left it running overnight and neither NBD nor LMDB got corrupted. Um, that's a neat like sort of point, but it doesn't actually mean as much as you think it means because what you don't see there is like, well, did the files actually get let out? Did the files not get let out? Did you, like, just because the database itself is encrypted doesn't mean that the actual transaction happened in a way that's safe. Um, so that was sort of step one, and step two is like put the shit in prod and see what happens. Going once, going twice. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.